I'm not one of those who is a short-term trader. I don't care if gold goes from 2450 to 2575. I own gold because I'm afraid in the set of circumstances in front of us over the next five years, not hopeful by the way, afraid that gold goes to $7,000 or $8,000 or $9,000. <laughs> uh, in my life, uh, I've been a beneficiary of four silver bull markets and they're truly spectacular events. At age 71, I'd like to experience just one more. The easy money's been made. I mean, make no mistake. If you wanted to make money easily in uranium, you would have gone into 2022 when everybody hated it. So what is your overall take of the oil market, oil and gas market right now, Rick? What do you I think? love it. I just love it. Uh, particularly the parts that other people don't like, North America natural gas. Mr. Rick Roll, thank you so much for coming back on the show, my friend. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. So we're going to do something special for today's show. We're going to go through the gambit of resource, energy, and mining stocks. Uh, this is going to cover uranium, gold, silver, and oil and gas, as well as coal. That's a special one that I haven't heard much of uh, much talk lately in the YouTube sphere. So we're going to cover those different sectors. Uh, Rick. Uh, you can kind of go over what your ranking system entails. I know you have a one to five ranking system, but I don't want to butcher your uh, the, the various interpretations of each rank. So if you can kind of take it from here in terms of explaining how you rank your uh, your, your resource uh, stocks. In fact, one to 10, one, one to 10. being best, 10 being worst. To put it in reference, uh, I've been doing this ranking for over 30 years. And if memory serves me well, uh, I've only given out nine rank, nine number one rankings uh, in 30 years. Uh, again, for reference, a one ranking is a company that I believe could be liquidated for twice its share price uh, to industry today, not relative valuation, but absolute valuation. I have to believe that it's more likely than not that my estimate of its value as opposed to its price will double within the two-year time frame, which is to say it is selling for 25% of what I think it'll be worth in two years. And I have to believe that there is a reasonable probability that uh, it will be worth 10 times as much five years from now as it is today. That's very, very, very rare. Uh, I also uh, insist that that company either have or uh, have a, a reasonable probability of what I would define as a tier one asset, which is to say in situ reserves and resources exceeding $10 billion, uh, that recoverable, uh, that would be in the best quartile in their industry subgroup, say gold or oil and gas, uh, in terms of all in sustaining capital, or par pardon me, all in sustaining cost, uh, while simultaneously being in the best quartile in terms of return on capital employed, but at least 25% uh, return on capital employed at today's commodity prices. That conjunction of attributes is very hard to find. <laughs> and the consequence of that is, as I say, I've given out nine number one rankings in 30 years of doing it. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, is a company that is, in my opinion, at once bankrupt and a fraud, uh, walking wounded, uh, promoted by, uh, you know, Jesse James or some sort of financial bandit uh, with no redeeming feature, where I think you could short the stock and should short the stock with complete impunity. Uh, most of the stocks that I rank vary between a seven uh, and a four. Uh, I don't have any twos currently. I have a few threes. Uh, the system probably skews to the better part of the rankings because out of 3,300 or 3,400 public natural resource companies in the world, uh, our rankings database follows 740 of them. Uh, many of the ones that aren't ranked, uh, I haven't received requests to rank, and I see no point in ranking them for my own portfolio because I think they're walking wounded. 
I suspect if we were able to or wanted to rank every public natural resource company in the world, that there would be a decided skew towards seven through nine. And that's pretty much what I've heard um, is the case across the various uh, natural resource sectors. Uh, you've really got to you've really got to find the outliers in this space, Rick. And also another disclaimer: this is just a snapshot in time, guys. So just because Rick gives that a, is so a true. Of, yeah, so it, it is, is June twentieth so right now. So just keep yeah. that in mind. So as of June twentieth, this is Rick's take on on these natural resource stocks. Okay, so let's go ahead and kick things off with gold, Rick. Uh, let's go ahead and start off with Newmont's. What's uh, what's your I ranking on Newmont? I currently have Newmont as a five. Uh, I think they have wonderful leverage to higher gold prices. I think that the that the acquisition of Newcrest was a good thing. Uh, I am reviewing them for upgrade based on their stated policy of selling a bunch of their second tier mines, which has been a problem for them operating too many second tier mines, uh, so that they can. Uh, uh, at once improve their balance sheet with the proceeds of those sales uh, and also focus on higher quality tier one assets. If they do that, I'm uh, certain that I will upgrade the ranking from five to four. They have extraordinary operating leverage if they clean up their operations. Franco Nevada. Franco Nevada? Yes, sir. Three. Uh a premium price for a premium product. It was a four. I upgraded to, to a three when the government of Panama stole Cerro Colorado. Uh, that asset, uh, which I believe there will be a recovery on, constituted 14% of their net asset value. And the market's response to the theft of that asset was to destroy 42% of market cap. The simple arithmetic is if you give up 14% and the market takes away 42%, uh, the stock's a bargain. Uh, while I would consider this to be a premium priced company, it deserves to be a premium price. The management expense ratio was 11 basis points, the lowest in mining by a country mile. The operating margins are the highest in the industry by a country mile. They have a 30 year culture of the employment, the intelligent employment of capital. Um, uh, a premium product. It's difficult for me to understand why anybody would construct a gold portfolio that didn't include Franco Nevada. What about Skeena Resources? Anything about them? Yeah, we have uh, we have Skeena at a five. Uh, again, reviewing it for an upgrade to four. Uh, I need to know a little more about how they sell the concentrate with all the penalty material. There's a bunch of bad stuff with the good stuff, <laughs> and I need to know a bit more about the metallurgical process by which they by which they uh, assemble and perhaps beneficiate their concentrate and who and how they sell it to. Certainly a wonderful deposit. Uh, and one of the uh, untold stories around Skeena is the very good relationship that they have developed with the Taltan First Nation, their host. I'm personally aware of that, knowing Jerry Asp, who runs economic development for the band, and knowing a bit Chad Day, the ancestral chief of the Tall Tens, both of whom speak well of Skeena. Triple flag precious metals. Uh, disclosure, I'm an owner here, like Franco. Uh, it's one of the second tier uh, royalty companies, second tier not in terms of management acumen, but rather just in terms of size. Royalty business is a very good business. Uh, I'm attracted to it. Uh, the triple flag people put together their royalty portfolio before royalties became popular. They were really an adjunct of commodities trading. So uh, I'm a holder. I have that as a four. And what about Tanzanian Gold Corp? Tanzanian Gold Corp I have as a six, a uh, possible downgrade to seven. Um, they have attracted uh, a large investment audience uh, because of a former uh, founder and promoter who, Jim Sinclair, a friend of mine who has since passed away. I don't like small mines. Uh, I, I don't like uh, mines that have less than sort of two and a half billion dollars in in situ recoverable reserves and resources. Uh, 
my experience has been that everything that can go wrong with a big mind can go wrong with a small mind, but a small mind can never make you big money. So the idea that I take a, I take a big risk for a small reward is not attractive to me. Highcroft Mining. Uh, Highcroft, I don't own. I know I know the deposit really, really, really well. Um, it, this is an optionality play. This is an enormous gold and silver resource, huge gold and silver resource. I owned it outright at one point in time personally years ago, so I know it fairly well. If you are the type of investor who believes that we're going to see in the next couple of years, you know, $4,000, $5,000 gold, you will make an absolute fortune on this. I am not certain that the deposit is economic at all at $2,400 gold. So it's purely an optionality play. For me at my age, you can take away some of my upside if you take away most of my downside. <laughs> so I'm not buying optionality plays very much anymore. And what about Westome gold mines? I don't know enough about Westome uh, anymore to comment. Uh, I sold my stock simply because it gave me everything I wanted in a relatively compressed period of time. And there were other Ontario development stories that I wanted to know better. Uh, I need to say that when I took it off my rankings list, when I stopped following it, it was a five. And Alamos Gold? Alamos I have as a four. I've known John McCloskey, the CEO personally, for I'm embarrassed to say 40 years. They have done a wonderful job of capital allocation. They have also done a wonderful job, which they don't get as much credit for, on implementation. They have maintained good return on capital employed. Uh, if I had a criticism, it's a, a whole collection of tier two assets, which is to say they don't have any uh, 5 million ounce deposit. They have a collection of 1.2, 1.3 million ounce deposits, but they operate them extraordinarily well. And Metalla Royalty and streaming? Uh, Metalla Royalty I have as a five. Uh, it used to be a six. Uh, E.B. Tucker and crew have done a great job of promoting. Uh, and my argument with Metalla wasn't necessarily the quality of the assets, but rather the price of the whole. They did too good a job for me. Uh, it was premium price. The market has taken back some of that. And as a consequence, I've upgraded it from six to five. And Caledonia Mining. I don't know enough about Caledonia to answer. Uh, my constraint with Caledonia was always size. I'm less afraid of Zimbabwe than other people are, but I was certainly unimpressed with the size of the prize at Caledonia. So generally speaking, what's kind of the, your take of the overall gold sector at this moment? Gold I love it. Yeah. I think it's due for a rest, but I think the gold price goes in, inexorably higher. Uh, I, by the way, I should tell your audience, I'm not one of those who is a short-term trader. I don't care if gold goes from 2450 to 2575. I own gold because I'm afraid in the set of circumstances in front of us over the next five years not hopeful, by the way, afraid that gold goes to $7,000 or $8,000 or $9,000. <laughs> uh, I also understand the juxtaposition between the gold price and the gold equities prices. The buyer of gold in the last four or five years has been central banks. They don't buy stocks. <laughs> they buy gold. When people look at the juxtaposition, it's that easy to figure out. Uh, until 10 weeks ago, there wasn't Western retail buying of gold. The ETF flows will sh will show you that. The buyer was the central banks. And the central banks don't buy gold stocks. When the momentum becomes established in the material and retail buyers come into the gold space, which they have in the last 10 years, you will see that buying come down to the gold stocks. Uh, it's just going to take a little time. Yeah, yeah. I think you've alluded to this in multiple interviews before, but at this very moment in time, gold and Gold stocks make up about 1% of total global assets. And, total, uh, total global assets. But the number in the U.S. is much more stark because of true, yeah. greater investment opportunity, particularly in technology in the United States. In the United States, it's less than one half of 1%. Yep. All right. So let's go ahead and pivot over to silver. Great. First on the list is Pan American Silver. I have Pan American Silver as a four, uh, looking to upgrade it to a three if I get breakthroughs either in Guatemala or Argentina. The explanation of that is that uh, Pan American has two spectacular assets which aren't producing for them in those locations. Both of them are 
500 million ounce high grade silver deposits. Both are non-producing as a consequence of politics. I think that both of those deposits are built into Pan American for free. Uh, and if I get any uh, movement on either of those, I will upgrade it to a three. The process in Pan American right now involves digesting the assets that they acquired from Yamana, disposing of the redundant assets and improving their balance sheet. Uh, and they've done a reasonable job of that so far. But the upside from my point of view is all about the assets that are shut in politically. And Vizsla Silver. Vizsla Silver, if you can afford exploration risk, I have it as a four. Uh, uh, and I have it as a four as opposed to a three simply because the share prices perform so well. You know, <laughs> part of it is the, the price that you pay for the size of the prize. Uh, Vizsla is a great deposit. It's well drilled, uh, it, meaning that I have high confidence in the existing data. Uh, I have high confidence too that they've reached their under the understanding of the deposit, where the exploration is becoming predictive. They know enough from prior data that they can gear future exploration to probabilities as opposed to possibilities. In, in my life, that's been a sort of a fulcrum point for deposits growing both by way of tons and grade. So I'm very attracted to Visla. Okay, so Fortuna Silver Mines. Fortuna Silver isn't a silver company anymore, really. Uh, by revenue, they're a gold company. It's important to know that. They've done a great job of implementation. Um, they Their expertise was narrow vein, high grade underground mines in Peru and Mexico. They pivoted from there to a high altitude, low grade open pit in Argentina, and they really stumbled. Uh, they were way behind schedule, way above budget. They got their market cap cut in half. Uh, but they persevered and they made that mine work. Uh, and then improbably, they went to Africa, having lots of expertise in Latin America. Improbably, too, thus far in Africa, they've succeeded. Uh, so uh, I have them as a four. Uh, my criticisms of them would be, again, uh, tier two and tier three mines. Uh, no tier one deposit. Bueno Ventura Mining Company. Uh, Buenaventura, I have as a four, very, very high quality assets, very, very high quality people, uh, local, regional, and national political risk uh, in Peru. Right now at the top of Peru, the administration is very pro-mining. In some of the departments of Peru, which is to say some of the localities uh, of Peru, the situation is much more challenging. There has been a history in Peru where the social benefits of mining have accrued to the capital, Lima, and the regions that bore the cost got none of the benefit. In mining parlance, uh, Lima got the money and the regions got the shaft. And the consequence of that is that Buenaventura faces real sociological and political challenges in rural Peru uh, expanding. And if the federal administration in Peru were to change to a more leftist administration, uh, the family that controls uh, Buenaventura would be viewed by that government as local capitalist caciques. Uh, it's impossible, however, to construct a high-quality silver portfolio without including Buenaventura. Here's another one. Uh, Coer Mining, C-O-E-U-R Mining. Coer, Coer, Coer Mining. Uh, leverage to the silver price in terms of perception probably more a gold producer than a silver producer. But both Coor and uh, Hecla have been brand names in the silver space in the United States for 50 years. The shareholder base is highly responsive to moves uh, in the silver price. Uh, I have Coor as a five verging on a six, uh, being downgraded not for performance, but simply because of share price performance. The, uh, the stock is up fairly substantially uh, in, the last, in the last six months. I need to tell your audience, particularly your trading audience, that if we experience a breakout in silver, that the breakout that you'll see in Coor and Hecla, irrespective of the underlying quality, will be spectacular. Orla Mining. Uh, Orla, uh, good people, good assets, albeit second tier assets. I have them as a five. Uh, I expect both assets to get better. 
again, my criticism would be uh, tier two assets, no tier one asset. Mag Silver? Mag Silver, I have as a five. Um, I own it. Uh, I'm a silver bull. I like high quality deposits. I think that I, I think the the company is fully priced, but I think that it will continue to uh, impress people in terms of their operating results. And I continue to believe that there's a lot of exploration upside with the company. Uh, they are joint venture partners uh, with uh, Fresnio, the largest primary silver producer in the world. Uh, they brought the deposit into production when they had enough reserve and resource to sustain the capital expenditure. Now I think they'll use the free cash flow to go back and finish off exploring uh, the resource. And I think that there'll be some exploration surprises to the upside. What about First Majestic? Uh, First Majestic, uh, I have as a six. Uh, I'm personally very friendly with Keith Newmeyer, the CEO. I have a lot of time for him. Uh, he has spent probably $80 million on financial public relations in the last 15 years, which means that his audience is highly responsive to the silver price. They've done a great job of implementation, buying old, tired mines and revitalizing them. The most recent one they bought, uh, Jarrett Canyon, uh, is going to be a challenge. Uh, that's why I have it as a six, not as a five. I have to see whether Keith and his team can work the same magic at Jarrett Canyon that they did at San Dimas. Uh, until I've seen evidence of an operating turnaround uh, at Jarrett, I'm not going to buy the stock. Okay. So what about Endeavor? Endeavor Silver or Endeavor, Endeavor Silver. Mining? Uh, Endeavor Silver. Endeavor. Endeavor Silver I have as a six, uh, uh, highly leveraged the silver price, but a collection of lower quality assets. And so what's kind of your, in similar fashion, what's kind of like your overall take of the silver market in general? Uh, uh, in my life, uh, I've been a beneficiary of four silver bull markets. And they're truly spectacular events. At age 71, I'd like to experience just one more. Uh, silver equities represents about 2.5% of my speculative portfolio. So a, a fairly small proportion of my net worth. If we experience a silver bull market, uh, I expect that 2.5% of my portfolio to become 25% of my portfolio. Um, so I, I own my silver portfolio, at least the speculative part of my portfolio, purely uh, with the part of my brain that's focused on greed. Uh, high risk, high reward. Let me give you a couple statistical uh, examples. In the decade of the 1970s, uh, before I was <laughs> wealthy enough to buy a lot of stuff or smart enough to identify what to buy, I watched Coeur d'Alene Mines, the Coeur that you just referred to earlier, then called Coeur d'Alene, go from $0.10 cents to $65 in 10 years. Uh, that sort of caught my attention, you know. Uh, I didn't own it, sadly, so it was only of academic interest. Uh, fast forwarding to the end of the decade of the 80s, the beginning of the decade of the 90s, I underwrote two silver mining companies, one Silver Standard at 72 cents with a full warrant. Six years later, it was a $45 stock. Uh, I also underwrote Pan American Silver for Ross Beatty at 50 cents, and it too uh, went to $40. <laughs> um, when the generalist money gets attracted to the precious metals sector, uh, precious metals bull markets are always led by gold. But when the generalist money gets attracted to the narrative and they start to come into the silver space, there is not enough market cap among the legitimate silver companies and the silver juniors to hold the money. Doug Casey likens it to trying to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. Uh, and truly spectacular things happen to market caps. So I, I hope that answers the question. It's something that speculators need to allow to take time. It can easily take five years for that to occur. And you have to endure absolutely breathtaking volatility. It's, a quin, it's akin to being a rodeo rider. But the rewards that you reap, uh, should your timing and patience be correct, are unbelievable. Well, wow. Well, here's another medal that uh, offers similar asymmetry, uranium. Let's go ahead and kick it off with Paladin. 
Uh, I'm attracted to Paladin again. You know, the market has loved it. And the only reason why I'm not wild about Paladin uh, is simply the reward that we've enjoyed. Remember that a basket of Uranium Juniors <clears throat> since 2022, when they were hated, are universally up fourfold or fivefold. So at the same time that they generate a lot more interest now, they have a lot less value. <laughs> When Paladin solved their debt problem, I briefly had them as a three. Uh, what's happened is they've gone up 350 or 400 percent since then. So they've gone backwards in my ranking simply because they've been too successful in building in building market cap. And you are energy. I don't own you are energy. I think it's going to do very well, but it's a collection of U.S. based assets uh, that makes U.S. people happy. But it isn't a company that I see commanding uh, the best AISC quartile uh, or the best ROC, ROCE quartile. Uh, I have them at a five because I think that they will attract the attention of American speculators. And I think that the political administration is in the United States is stupid enough that after five or six years of vilifying the uranium industry, they're actually going to be dumb enough to subsidize it. Uh, and I think that that, well, as a taxpayer, I think that's idios, idiocy. Uh, as a speculator, I understand the importance of that to shareholders. Hey guys, quick pause. Have you ever dreamed about seeing any of the cool guests that we get on Capital Cosm or that you see on these other YouTube channels in person? Well, now you can. We can see Rick Rule, Adrian Day, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Dr. Nomi Prinz, Grant Williams, James Rickards, Lobo Tigre, and more. You can do so by joining the Rick Wool Symposium July 7th through the 11th. You can register now. Link to that is down below. And it takes place in Boca Raton, Florida, on a beach resort. You get to meet all the cool people that you've been watching on YouTube. And you get to do it beachside on a resort. What more do you want? If you're interested, link to that is down below. And let's get back to the video. Is that a problem? Large shareholder of Kazan Prom. Uh, you take a lot of political risk here. Uh, they have the best development pipeline with the possible exception of next gen in the industry. They have a wonderful collection of talent. Unfortunately, there's some internal political turmoil in the company that I can't ascertain that's caused a lot of the people that I like the most to leave. Uh, that is a risk. Wonderful Energy. dividend, you know. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Just a wonderful dividend. You get paid to wait there. Okay. So what about energy fuels? Uh, energy fuels uh, reminds me more than anything else of UR Energy, a collection of American assets attractive to American speculators, <laughs> likely to benefit from the stupidity of Congress, uh, but a collection of, uh, at best, second tier assets. A permitted and, and permitted oh. and permitted tailings. Uh, which is really nice. Uh, you know, the permitting process in the United States is getting ugly and they don't have to do it. They're already permitted. Gotcha. And what about uh, Bannerman? Uh, I own Bannerman <clears throat> because I'm a huge fan of their CEO. I don't own it necessarily because of the size of the prize. Uh, again, I don't see that as a tier one asset. But I think that... <clears throat> when consolidation comes through the uranium junior space that the management team there is so good that they will either be consolidated on terms that are beneficial to their shareholders or they will become consolidators i own it because of the guy and next gen next gen i have is a four uh it's the best undeveloped uranium deposit on the planet uh, I continue to be concerned about very high levels of general and administrative expense. Uh, I have to give Lee Courier credit. He came on my show uh, when I expected, when I expressed skepticism and said, let's air it in public. Uh, so the guy's got the stones. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what sponsoring sporting events and Formula One racing and stuff like that has to do with the cost of capital of the uranium producer. So I continue to be skeptical about their financial public relations expenditure. But you can't be skeptical about the deposit. It's the best undeveloped deposit in the world. They've done an excellent job of implementation with regards to the permitting regime in Canada, uh, 
they haven't had to prosecute the exploration upside <laughs> because they've discovered so much already. They, uh, and I verified this, have very good relationships with their host First Nations. They've done a really good job in the last five or six years, pre-construction, uh, managing the expectation of the community and delivering uh, on advanced benefit agreements. Uh, I, I, as I say, while I'm critical of the level of overhead, uh, uh, I understand now the last financing which they did, which I was highly critical of. Uh, and I remain concerned about the level of the financial public relations expenditure, and in particular, the orientation of the financial public relations expenditure, which I'm afraid may have more to do with the egos of the board of directors uh, than lowering their cost of capital. Okay, so what about Fission, Fission Uranium? Uh, I own Fission. Uh, I think whoever builds uh, NextGen will want to build fission simultaneously. They're both 300 kilometers west of any infrastructure. And my suspicion is that the duplicate infrastructure by way of say camps, power generation, stuff like that, if they built those deposits together as opposed to separately, shareholders would probably save five or $600 million, which is a lot of money. So I'm hoping that fission gets consolidated into next gen or whoever takes over one takes over the other. And fission would appear to be a cheaper entry, next gen being the larger and higher quality asset. But fission is still a very high quality asset. Coming in second to next gen is, you know, sort of like coming in next to God. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. What about Global Atomic? Uh, Global Atomic is really a play on their ability to get along with the government of Niger. It's a vi very high quality project. Uh, I am... reasonably confident that the beef in Niger is be between Niger and France uh, and that the political reliance of the government of Niger on the Russians will not result in the government of Niger stealing the deposits enjoyed by Global Atomic uh, at all uh, and handing them over to Wagner. But that's the risk that you run. High quality assets, uh, it will be less difficult to finance those assets to production than Westerners are led to believe. The people who finance it won't be Barclays. Uh, they won't be Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, it'll be Industrial Commercial Bank of China <laughs> or somebody like that. That's uncomfortable to Western investors. Uh, if you're a veteran natural resource investor like me, you understand that occasionally in your career, uh, you accommodate strange bedfellows. Okay. What about Deep Yellow? Large shareholder. Uh, I've been a beneficiary of John Borshoff's efforts back to the original Paladin, uh, which was the single most uh, successful speculation of my career. Uh, John's done everything right. Uh, Deep Yellow was a spinoff of the redundant assets in Paladin, something Paladin had to do when they experienced financial difficulty. John did a great job of identifying the assets that he wanted to work on, raising money largely from me in 2021 and 2022 when no one cared, beneficiating those assets, and then acquiring more assets by acquisition. He's done everything perfectly. The risk is he's in his mid-70s. Uh, you really, truly have key man risk here. There has never been a harder working person in my career. Uh, I was unconcerned about his work schedule when he was in his 50s, but that was 20 years ago. <laughs> my my nervousness uh, around Paladin is the, uh, not I'm not Paladin Deep Yellow is that it's unusually reliant of the on the efforts of one man, uh, and, and that one man <clears throat> is <laughs> even older than me. Okay, what about Boss Energy? Uh, Boss Energy is fully priced. They've done a superb job. Uh, I sold enough boss that I no longer had uh, any cost in my position. My position was fairly large. And then I watched the senior management team, Duncan Crabb and all those people who did a wonderful job building the company in the last 10 years, sell 60 or 70% of their position. And I figured, well, you know what? They know more about it than me. So I sold 60 or 70% of the remaining part of my position. <laughs> 
Um, I understand why they did it. You know, they worked hard for no compensation for six or seven years. They put the thing in production, which is what they said they were going to do. They were five or 600% up in their position and they decided to get paid. Since they decided to get paid, I decided to get paid. Fair enough. Well, what's your overall take of the uranium market then? The easy money has been made. I mean, make no mistake. If you wanted to make money easily in uranium, uh, you would have gone into 2022 when everybody hated it. Uh, the arithmetic was stupid. If you go back to the podcast that I did in 2022, I did everything but call your goddamn broker. You know, uh, the stuff was selling for 20 bucks a pound. It was costing the industry fully loaded 60 bucks to make it. If the uranium price didn't go up, the lights would go out. It was that simple. You had to ask yourself from 2022, are the lights going to go out in 2027 or is the uranium price going to go above $60? That was the equation. Everybody hated uranium. If they didn't hate it, they were merely bored by it. There's nothing a speculator loves, a real speculator loves more than hate. But the easy money now has been made. The price didn't go to 60. It went to 90. Uh, that package of stocks, which was unloved, became at least tolerated, uh, often liked, and sometimes loved. So the easy money has been made. What is happening in uranium is that the very structure of the market is changing. Uh, I don't have time to take you through chapter and verse of this, but suffice to say that with more of the transactions taking place in the term market, uranium producers, unlike the producers of any other commodity in the world, can lock in price and volume for as long as 20 years, which means that you take away the pricing and margin uncertainty in uranium. The cost of capital in the uranium business over five years should migrate down to the lowest cost of capital of any resource commodity because of the certainty that lenders and equity holders have with regards to product sales volumes and product sales pricing. It'll take five years for these opaque term contracts to become reflected in the market. But uh, I guess the quote is that while the easy money has been made in eight or 10 select issuers, the sure money is ahead of us. Okay. Well, you want to talk about hated sectors. I've got one for you. What about coal? Let's go ahead and kick yeah. things off with coal. Well, you know, uh, the, the coal equities are uniformly up 50% this year. Mm. Uh, so coal was much more hated. It, it, it's a wonderful subject, you know, uh, when I talk to Cole about audiences, you know, to audiences, they say, well, it's going away, except it's not. Uh, the greatest demand year on record was 2023 and 2024 is bigger. While there are problems with regards to coal, not just uh, carbon, but particulate pollution, real problems associated with coal, um, poor countries can't do without it. Your listeners should become aware of two facts. The first is that there's a billion people on earth with no access to electricity and they would like to live like you and I do. And that requires coal, whether we like it or not. Uh, people in the West, which is to say rich people, the Greta Thornburgs of the world, you know, that noted energy physicist uh, say, well, the answer of course is alternative energies. Well, let's look at the math. And by the way, I'm in favor of alternative energies. But we spent well in excess of $5 trillion on alternative forms of electrical generation over 40 years. And that $5 trillion expenditure has reduced the market share of carbon-based fuel from a high of 82% 40 years ago, all the way down to 81% today. A $5 trillion investment has reduced the market share of fossil fuels by 1% from 82 to 81 Peak demand for fossil fuels, uh, which the big thinkers of the world, you know, President Biden, Angela Merkel, those morons, uh, they believe that peak demand is going to occur in 2030 or 2031. It's going to occur in 2065 or 2070. <laughs> so the tail end of a net present value calculation around coal or oil and gas is probably triple what the big thinkers think it is. Coal benefits from that. All right, let's start off with Peabody. Uh, I have Peabody as a five, very large coal producer, very large resources, great product pipeline. They are not 
in the best quartile worldwide in terms of either return on capital employed or all in sustaining cost. What about Stanmore, Cole? Uh, Stanmore, uh, I have as a four, uh, a, a smaller company than Peabody. Uh, I prefer size in the coal business, uh, but I am attracted to Stanmore. And Arch Resources? Uh, Arch Resources, I don't own. Uh, uh, again, U.S.-based, which gives you the appearance of political stability, good export markets, but they are not in the best quartile in either return on capital employed uh, or all in sustaining cost. Warrior Met Coal? Uh, Warrior Met Coal, the same comment in terms of where it exists in return on capital employed and cost of capital. And Alliance Resource Partners? Exactly the same comment. The uh, the questioners are largely, obviously, U.S.-based, talking about mostly U.S.-based producers. Uh, I, I, in my grandmother's culinary description, good, but not yummy. Uh, Whitehaven, Cole. Uh, Whitehaven I have as a four. Uh, cheap, uh, not necessarily the highest quality assets, but cheap relative to free cash flow and net present value. Alpha Metallurgical Resources. Same comment as the other U.S. producers. And Glencore? Uh, I own a lot of Glencore. Uh, Glencore is not primarily a coal producer, but they're the most efficient coal producer in the world. Uh, all of their assets are tier one assets in terms of return on capital employed and also in terms of their all in sustaining costs. You don't buy them as a pure play on coal, though. They're copper producers. You know, they're they produce a wide variety of industrial commodities. It's worthy to note that they reacted to the downturn in favor for the coal business by buying coal assets like mad when everybody else was selling them, including buying in 40% of a deposit in Columbia that they operated, uh, a 30 year mine life at 1.5 times free cash flow. Do you have any ones in your coal portfolio, Rick? Do you see any ones? I don't have any ones in any of my portfolios. No. What, what's the highest score that you have in the coal space? Uh, four. Four? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Four, well, is, four is generous for me, by the way. Right. Uh, as I said, I think at the beginning of the interview, if you took all 34 or 3,500 natural resource companies in the world, I follow 740. But if I was able to follow, follow all of them, I would suggest that the median or the mean would be somewhere around 7 or 7.5. Understood. All right. Well, let's go, to, go ahead and pivot over to oil and gas. Yep. Start things off with Halliburton. What do you think of Halliburton? Halliburton is an oil company. It's a technology company. I own Halliburton, but I don't rank it. My... Uh, my definable expertise in technology and process is not good. So I own Halliburton and Schlumberger both, uh, but I don't rank them. Gotcha. And Enbridge? Uh, Enbridge I do own. I have it as a five uh, utility scale company. What you need to understand is if there's a change in the political leadership in Canada, uh, which I hope there will be, uh, Enbridge will do very well. I don't consider them an oil and gas company. I consider them to be a uh, utility slash transmission company. Gotcha. Love, lovely dividend and extremely sustainable. Exxon? Exxon, I just upgraded to a three uh, because of share price declines in the last month. Um, just a superb company. Wonderful allocators of capital, high return on capital employed. Unlike the rest of the industry, making sustaining capital investments, not cannibalizing themselves. At the same time, making a series of discoveries in Guyana, 11 billion recoverable barrels, that's profound enough to move a company the size of Exxon. Rather than decapitalizing, which many companies are doing, they just spent $60 billion buying Pioneer, doubling down, or I would say doubling up on their Permian Basin exposure. While they're spending all this money growing the business, they've increased returns to shareholders by way of dividends and stock buybacks by 14% this year, which looks to set, set to continue for the next five years. Uh, it, it, it's difficult for me to understand how a thinking person 
could construct a natural resource portfolio and not include Exxon. All right. Well, Kiera. Kiera? Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you're you're talking more about a service and supply company, a pipeline company, than you are a utility. So I don't rank it, but I do own it. Gotcha. Uh, Chevron? Chevron I have as a four. Uh, I, I think it's a, a good company. Uh, in fact, I think it's a great company. I just don't think it's as good as Exxon. <laughs> what about range resources? Uh, range, I don't. I, I wouldn't say I don't follow them. They're under review, like Woodside. It's a complex business, and understanding it requires a lot of work. And I'm an old man with less time than I used to have. Okay. Uh, Birchcliff Energy. Birch Sorry? Uh, Birchcliff? Birch yeah. Birchcliff, I have a four. Uh, my criticism is that they aren't spending enough money on sustaining capital. They're distributing it to shareholders. It is highly, highly, highly leveraged to Canadian natural gas, which is a sector I love. Uh, if uh, Mr. Trudeau uh, is allowed to pursue other employment opportunities over the next couple of years, uh, he's the prime minister of Canada. Uh, I think you'd see an, emer an immediate double in Birchcliff and Pato. EQT Corp. Uh, I own it. Uh, the old equitable. Uh, equitable is a wonderful play on U.S. natural gas, particularly in the Marcellus Basin. Uh, high quality asset deployers. Uh, some challenges in the balance sheet, to be honest with you, uh, but I own it. What about Shell? Uh, I have Shell as a five. They have not been making sufficient sustaining capital investments. Uh, I think the senior management team is too politically driven. Uh, there has been a, a, a public pivot in Shell away from their core oil and gas business to other forms of energy. Uh, they're now pivoting back to oil and gas, but I would suggest that they wasted 10 years being politically correct. Transocean? Uh, Transocean, again, you're in the service and supply business, so I'd rather duck the question. I don't own them. Gotcha. Uh, British Petroleum? Uh, BP, uh, the cells tiled beyond petroleum, I have as a six. They have good legacy assets. The direction of the company has been towards political correctness as opposed to profitable oil and gas operations. Uh, Comstock? Uh, Comstock, I don't own. Uh, that strikes me. I mean, they've been a highly successful consolidator and implementer in the U.S. Uh, I have them as a five. I have to admit that Comstock is one that's been very active in the M&A space that I need to revisit. So my ranking is stale. Uh, Petrobras. Uh, Petrobras I own. Uh, I have them as a four. I may downgrade them to a five. Uh, there's political pressure in Brazil in the form of the current president, Lula, to greatly increase the dividend in Petrobras so that he can uh, pursue some of his socialist agenda which would reduce the amount of sustaining capital investment and new project investment that Petrobras is going to make without substantial investments on the uh, Atlantic margin and their subsalt. Um, their ability to continue to generate as much free cash flow as they do will be constrained by a lack of sustaining capital investment. Great asset base. Uh, technologically much better than people understand. They're absolutely world class margin and subsalt explorers, which people don't understand. But if they can't spend the money, uh, they won't be able to enjoy the fruits of that knowledge. So what is your overall take of the oil market, oil and gas market right now, Rick? What do you I think? love it. I just love it. Uh, particularly the parts that other people don't like, North American natural gas. North American natural gas is oversupplied because it's a byproduct from shale oil drilling. Uh, the consequence of that is that the prices are very low, encouraging demand, including the relocation of the European chemical industry to the United States, uh, and also the construction of liquefied natural gas plants uh, in the United States and where permissible in Canada. This is a circumstance that corrects itself over five years. There are two deltas. One is the BTU delta between oil and gas, which is decidedly in oil's favor, and the market will correct this over time. Uh, the second delta is the price of North American natural gas in North America and the price of that same gas in Tokyo or Shanghai or Rotterdam. 
uh, that gas sells uh, in this hemisphere for $2.50 a million BTU, and in those hemispheres for $8 a million BTU. Uh, it costs you 75 cents or a buck to get it from here to there. We are building billions of dollars worth of LNG export facilities and billions of dollars of regasification facilities and billions of dollars of liquefied natural gas transporters to eliminate that delta. As that delta is eliminated, uh, the benefit will flow not just to international consumers, but also to North American producers. And this is uh, the closest thing that one can see to a certainty in the five-year time frame. Meanwhile, the very low natural gas prices uh, in this hemisphere are penalizing earnings and causing people not to be attracted to what I see as an annuity style investment over the next five years. What would probably be your most asymmetric view on a sector right now? What <clears throat> sector kind of takes that cake? Uh, it's two years from now. Uh, being forward looking, it'll be lithium. Uh, lithium was the flavor of the month. Uh, and, and it's going to be one of the most hated speculators, uh, hated commodities among speculators going forward. We never had a lithium shortage. Uh, demand for lithium increased faster than our ability to de-bottleneck processing facilities. We always had sufficient reserves and resources. But when the price went up, people started looking for lithium like mad and they found it. <laughs> they found a lot of it. Meanwhile, we've debottlenecked the supply. So the price of lithium, having gone up sixfold, has retreated by 75%. As we bring on the permitted and financed projects into production, we're going to have a flood of lithium on the market. Uh, and, and people for whom lithium was the commodity of the second four years ago, they'll hate lithium. Uh, lithium will, ex will enjoy the same low repute that uranium and silver enjoyed in 2022. And when that happens, uh, I'll be able to pick up uh, the fruits of 400 or 500 million dollar investments with 60 or 70 million dollar market caps. Uh, lithium will be uranium revisited two years from now. So I'm boning up as much as I possibly can on the lithium business, understanding that the knowledge won't be useful to me till I'm 73 years of age. I see. Other, other sectors that are attractive to me are nickel. Okay. Precisely because the price has declined by 50%, people hate it. They're shutting in sulfide nickel production around the world. Uh, there's nothing I like, like uh, prices that are depressed enough that productive capacity is getting shuttered. That cures the supply problem. And platinum group metals. Uh, again, the prices have fallen by 50%. Easy to understand why. The Russians need money. The Russians are big producers. So the Russians are selling all the inventory that they have of nickel, platinum, and palladium onto the market, depressing the price. Meanwhile, deferring their own sustaining capital investments, which will make them less competitive investors over the next five years. So I'm attracted to the platinum and palladium space too, particularly attracted to platinum, palladium, and nickel assets that aren't located in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia. I see. So I, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this. Do you see any white whales out there, meaning any ones, any, any, anything that you would rank a one out there, regardless of nope. the sector? Nope, nope, nope. Nothing? Nope. Okay. I've had okay. nine ones in 35 years. I see. My criteria for a one is that I have to believe it's selling for half of its current liquidation value. Not market cap equivalent, but real liquidation value. Right. I have to believe that my estimate is of its liquidation value will double over two years, meaning it's selling at a uh, at twenty five percent of my expected realized price in two years. Uh, they have to have access to a tier one deposit, which is to say, in situ recoverable reserves and resources exceeding ten billion dollars at current commodity prices, uh, and they have to be run by a first class person. That's a very rare conjunction of attributes. The last one that I gave was Ivanhoe Mines uh, back almost 10 years ago. They were selling for 63 cents a share. They had 93 cents a share cash. They had three assets, one of whom, one of which the government of Japan had paid $200 million for a 10% interest in, which is to say the sum of the parts for a company that was selling at 63 cents was worth, in my mind, $2. <laughs> they had the Kamoa Kakula deposit, which I understood from existing drilling. 
uh, was going to be an absolute top tier copper deposit. So I could see how in my own mind over five years, my estimate of net present value would grow up would go up tenfold as appears to as opposed to merely twofold. They were run by Robert Friedland, who I consider to be the most successful mining financier of my generation. And the value was established because the government of China had done a dollar thirteen private placement. <laughs> and I could buy three months later the same stock for 63 cents. That's what a one looks like. Now, a one means that you have to have the courage to have assets concentrated in South Africa and Congo. Uh, it's important that you know what can go wrong with speculation too. If all you can see is roses, you don't know enough to own the stock. So I want to understand the reason why the stock is so cheap. Um, Ivanhoe today, as you know, isn't a $63 stock. It's a $15 stock. Um, yeah. Well, I know you have the Rick Rule Symposium coming up. Do you want to talk about that? I want to talk about a couple things. Uh, anybody who cares what I have to say about natural resources can personalize it. Go to ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource stocks, and I'll personally rank them one to 10. Note, my rankings are harsh, and they're snapshots in time. The conference, and thank you for mentioning that, is in its 28th year. I believe it to be the finest natural resource conference on the planet. High-quality macro speakers, but more importantly, great analysts who have made money in the natural resource space over three decades. Two, uh, every public company at the conference has been vetted, meaning we need to own them in our own accounts or they can't appear on our floor. No guarantee because I own something, it'll go up, but there is a guarantee that the process is honest. Living legends, people who have built multi-billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch telling you how they did it and the lessons that they learned, helping you to find $5 million companies that will become $5 billion companies. All of the proceedings are taped, meaning that you can enjoy and use the proceedings for the balance of 2024, even the breakout sessions. Attend live July 7 through 11 in Boca Raton, Florida, or via live stream from the comfort and convenience of your own home. In either case, if you think for any reason that you didn't get enough value from the conference to justify your tuition, email me. 100% gold-plated money-back guarantee. One more time. 100% no questions asked, gold-plated money-back guarantee. Live, which I would prefer in Boca Raton, or if you can't come, join over a 1,000 people in 30 countries watching it via live stream, comfort and convenience of your own home. And uh, anything, any socials you want to drop, Rick? Where can people find you? Uh, Rick at Rural Investment Media is my personal email address. Uh, go to Rural Investment Media to rank your companies or go to the Rural Classroom where we have 200 hours of free instructional programming on mining and natural resource investing. One more time, free Rural Classroom. Fantastic. If you guys want to attend the Rick Rule Symposium, link to that is down below. Check it out. Uh, hope to see you guys there. Um, also, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to write Rick Rule Rules in the comments down below. Also give us a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. 85% of you guys who watch this channel are not subscribed. So let's go ahead and flip that ratio around. And with that said, I will see you in the next episode. Bye guys. Thank you.